So I think we are live now. Right. Uh, very good evening to everyone. Welcome to the third talk of the Indophone inaugural talk series. I am Somdev Kaur. I'm a faculty member in the Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Roper. Today we have uh, our guests with us, Professor KP Mohanan and Professor Tara Mohanan. They will be introduced momentarily. But before we uh, get introduced with our speakers today, I would like to give a very brief uh, introduction to this uh, Endophone talk series. So uh, for this is mainly for the benefit of the participants who may be joining us today for the first time. So Indophone um, started uh, very recently. The main motivation behind the idea of Indophone was born out of the awareness that there is a lack of a formal community within Indian linguistics that focuses on speech related research. So over time, uh, we hope to build a collective phonetics phonology enthusiasts to further research in these areas and Indophone marks the beginning of this attempt. We have also started um, a Discord server channel that is hashtag no coda. So concurrent with the Indophone talk series, we will be working on the knowledge and collaborative discussion Agora. That's what no coda stands for. So this is a community of researchers who want to build a non-hierarchical research and collaboration framework that emphasizes the need for free flow of ideas, questions, data, methods, and science. We believe that uh, constant and uh, curiosity-filled engagement with science is what, we, what would free it from already existing socially constructed hierarchies. Within this broad goal, the functional practices involve constant dialogue and discussion that build on already existing frameworks such as OSF.io. We are a co-op for ideas, exchange, and co-evolution of best practices. We believe that every time we seek or offer to help, we grow. So there are five of us in Endophone. We are currently working behind the scene. So I am introducing today with me, there is uh, Dr. Renu Punus from IIT Palakkar. There is, of course, not uh, on the screen today, but we are all working together. There is Dr. Professor, sorry, there is Professor Sakundala Mohanta from IIT Guwahati, Professor Indranil Dutta from Jadapur University, Dr. Amales Go from Tejpur University, of course, Dr. Renu Punus from IIT Palakkar, and me, Shomdevkar at IIT Roper. Um, Today is our third talk. Earlier, we had uh, two very interesting talks by Dr. Samiruddha Khan and Professor Priti Rao. And the inaugural series, which began on 5th October and it will end on 15th December this year, have a very exciting lineup of experts working on diverse aspects of politics and phonology in different parts of the world. Today, as you know, it is the third talk and my colleague, Dr. Rinu Punus, will now take over to introduce our esteemed speakers for the day. Over to you, Rinu. Thank you, Somdev. Good evening, everyone. Uh, today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, two pioneers in the field of linguistics, uh, Professors K.P. Mohanan and Professor Tara Mohanan. Uh, they really need no introduction, but uh, I'm going to try and do the impossible uh, in a minute. I try and sort of summarize uh, their amazing profiles in, in, in a very, very brief time. Uh, K.P. Mohanan, he prefers to be called Mo or Mohanan. Uh, please make note of that point. He did his PhD in linguistics from MIT and taught at the University of Texas at Austin, um, uh, Stanford University also, and the National University of Singapore. At NUS, he was an active member of the University Curriculum Committee and the University Committee for Educational Policy and the architect of general education program. In 2011, he joined the ISER Pune faculty from where he retired at the end of 2016. Uh, Tara Mohanan did her PhD in linguistics at Stanford and taught at the National University of Singapore till 2006, um, when she resigned to return to India uh, to be with her aging parents. 
she has a range um, of educational experience that you know spans from experimenting with inquiry oriented activities uh, in a second grade class and a right to advising PhD scholars writing a doctoral dissertation. Uh, Tara and Mo are of course uh, you know renowned. Uh, they are both well known internationally. They're well known researchers in theoretical linguistics, known for both individual and their joint works uh, in phonology and syntax, uh, extending to morphology and grammatical semantics. They co-designed an inquiry-oriented undergraduate program in linguistics at NUS and created a web course on academic knowledge and inquiry uh, before the idea of MOOCs came into existence. They are uh, co-founders of Think, uh, along with Madhav Kaushish, and continue their joint work as educator, mentor, researcher, thinkers in inquiry and integration for transdisciplinary knowledge and for education. As part of this work, they have been involved in developing teaching learning materials um, for inquiry and critical thinking and have been commissioned by UNESCO MG IEP on global citizenship. Today, uh, they will be interacting with us on the topic, leading issues and theoretical questions in phonetics and phonology from a histor historical perspective. Um, thank you both, Mo and Tara, for agreeing to speak at Endophon. Over to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this is going to be a conversation between Tara and me. It will be a five-part conversation. Those of you who have watched the video know this. It will be in five parts, and after each part, We'll take uh, clarificatory questions. Um, and we hope that most of you have watched the video and also uh, at least had a chance to look at the 24-page documents that uh, expands on the video. So shall we, uh, uh, shall we? Yes, start? sure. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Mo. So yeah. I'll be sharing the uh, screen and the video will run. So after each part, we'll pause for a few minutes. So if you have any questions, as Mo um, explained, uh, you please put your uh, questions on the uh, YouTube uh, comment section. And we'll place them here for clarification. If you still have some questions, you can hold it till the end. We will have a bit longer session towards the end of all the talk, Sorry, all the videos. Um, okay, so let's start it. Just a second. Hi, I'm Mohanan. Hi, I'm Tara. Um, The sound is gone. Um, Somdev, Somdev? No... Somdev? I'll just check. I think there is a there is a slight technical glitch. Let's just. Is that that okay. Okay. I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. All right. Um, is it okay now? Be not yeah. a regular talk, talk, uh, talk yeah. about our research, but it's a conversation between the two of us. Yeah, and it's a conversation in which um, we will do it in four parts or perhaps five parts. Um, we will begin with a kind of broad story of the evolution of linguistics over uh, since the 50s. Uh, and then we will go on to, um, you know, some of the important things that we will talk about specifically, and then go into three parts of the substance of the, yeah. of the conversation. Yeah. And in the end, we'll try and pull the pieces together. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's more going, more on the kind of education talk rather than it's not the just research talk. It's not just yeah. education, but the uh, perhaps you could call it the sociology of research. Uh, sort of? No, not, 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 not the sociology of linguistics research, yeah. and the kind of 
leading ideas which have come in the theoretical uh, phonology and theoretical phonetics? Leading ideas and um, theoretical questions and major shifts. Yeah. Think. So this is not going to be about the latest theory available, latest framework available, and so on. Nor will it yeah. be about the work that we have done. Yeah. So. Actually, uh, before we start, uh, just to place uh, what we're saying in mm. context, um, we've been extremely fortunate to have been perhaps in the right place at the right time and been able to um, so you have not just be restricted to phonetics and phonology, but you've uh, worked in phonetics, phonology, morphology. Taking what we've gathered from there to the study of, for example, mathematics, the physical sciences, biological sciences, human sciences, and all of that. So, yeah. um, we are trying to bring a little bit of that perspective into... Yeah, bring that back to linguistics. Linguistics. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, without straying too much out of phonetics and phonology. We're we'll trying to do that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, let's sketch the kind of evolution of the major landmarks yeah. of the evolution of uh, right. phonetics phonology. Uh, Maybe we should begin with. Uh, I think I'd be as the first switch perhaps was IPA to distinctive features. That's right. Yeah. Uh, driven by the drum school. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then from after that, so um, it was distinctive features which were used all the way up to uh, Chomsky and Halle in 1960. Sound pattern. Yeah, sound pattern. Yeah. Um, and after that, uh, that kind yeah, of right. continued. Yeah. In Till about. 70s, like 74, 75. Early seven, no, early yeah. 70s. Yeah. So with Kant's thesis on syllable structure. Yeah, and then came uh, all of the, the so-called non-linear phonology, and then came shifts in the modularity. So these are the kinds of things we are going to focus on, um, which are the uh, major components of the architecture of a linguistic theory, uh, perhaps all theories. But I don't know if everyone sees it that yeah. way, but uh, at least for linguistics, yes. This is going you to be our personal perspective right. of how the evolution you know, played out. Yeah. Yeah. In, yeah. And it's uh, we do it primarily in three components. The rules and const rules or constraints, however you want to see it. Rules and constraints, um, the representational systems, representations in phonetics and phonology. And the modularity of grammar. The, 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 so these are the, the elements that contribute to the, uh, the central elements yeah. that contribute to the architecture, architecture. of a theory yeah. or a framework or a model, yeah. whichever. Yeah. And we are going to emphasize the the ideas, the leading ideas of the theoretical issues, the central questions about these leading ideas. Um, and we will also touch upon the, we'll separate the leading ideas from the formalisms uh, because the same ideas can be expressed in different formalisms. Some of them which may have some empirical consequences and others not. But these two must be kept separate from the notation uh, of uh, the way in which the formalisms are expressed. So yeah, so the yeah. same formalism can be expressed in different notations, whether it's yeah. uh, Venn diagrams in tree versus yeah. tree diagrams, boxes yeah. versus circles, or you know, arrows you know, and you know, lines yeah. and arrows. What those lines mean? Yeah. And cetera. the terminology, a lot of terminology, which is yes. yeah, they express the same theoretical ideas. Right. So now it's also important to keep separate the formalisms and notations on the one hand, and the theoretical substance that they're trying to yeah. express on the other. So. And we'll be focusing on the theoretical ideas okay. and uh, the, the, the sense that we have when we look at the evolution of phonetics, phonology or syntax is that some of the leading ideas once they emerged have remained the same with mild, mild changes. But so we are trying to, trying to outline what the core of these ideas, the, un, the things which are unchanged. Uh, so I think uh, what we will focus on are the major conceptual changes yeah, in the theory. Right. Yeah. Not the technical formal changes. Okay. We'll also talk about formal changes, but our interest is in the conceptual aspects of linguistic theory. 
And I think we also will, um, because of our experience with syntax and semantics and so on, we will do some cross-referencing where relevant. Yeah, minimally. minimally. And maybe make some reference to science in general or even... Maybe. Okay. Maybe, yeah. yeah. We can't, is, we can't yeah. mathematics yeah. and so on. See yeah. how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. So is this a good time to stop and... Uh, stop for questions or... Call? Yeah, very briefly. Yeah. It's, Only uh, for sort of clarificatory questions. Not for other kinds so of questions. Actually, we'll follow that part. Yeah. We will do this in um, small parts, five, four or five parts. At the end of each part, we will stop for clarificatory questions. And then once all of these parts are done, then we will have general questions and comments yeah. on all of the parts together. Right. Um, this uh, we're just taking a small break here for clarificatory questions. Um, does anybody want to ask Mohantara anything at this point? So no questions so far. Yet. Yeah. Right. I think we'll just wait a. Uh, yeah, maybe yeah. a minute or so. Yeah, yeah, before we resume. Yeah. But we haven't yeah. said much so far. So Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. meanwhile, if you have anything to add, Mohan or Tara, uh, about the first part, then uh, there is uh, some questions coming. OK. And, uh, Right. Uh, uh, um, Indra asks, how should we understand the linearity? If there is one between the switch from IPA to distinctive features, what was shared and what was different between these approaches? Um, we are going to actually deal with that when we talk about the differences in the representational systems. Uh, the, the, it's a difference in the classificatory system. Uh, the way segments are categorized and represented. Um, so I think we'll wait until wait we... till then, right? Yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. We'll remember to pull this back up then. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. When we're done with that section, yeah. right? Uh, any more questions, though? Uh, no, okay, no, let's not yet. Yet. So then, shall we move to the next yeah. part and let us no. say sure. yeah. we'll come towards sure. the end? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Let's do that. So let us go to that. Hi, uh, so now we go on to talk about uh, rules uh, or constraints. Uh, we might use the term laws or principles instead of rules, um, but they all mean the same thing. So, okay. We're not making any distinctions. The major distinction is between rules and constraints, where when you talk about rules, you're talking about procedures, right? And uh, typically, rules are associated with something that happens sequentially. And constraints are associated with some kind of a simultaneous application type thing. Um, so there is always this, uh, this has been a struggle, I think, a conceptual struggle all through. Should um, the patterns and the pattern, inter pattern interactions be stated in terms of rules or constraints? Should the models be sequential or simultaneous? Uh, so that's one major conceptual uh, idea that has sort of been part of linguistic theory all through. Um, one of the interesting characteristics of uh, theoretical linguistics, and when you say theoretical linguistics, we are talking about the kind of formal theoretical linguistics that started with Chomsky, Chomsky's PhD thesis and syntactic structures. 1956 yeah. syntactic structures. Uh, the, the 
this essential characteristic is a way of expressing regularities <coughs> in terms of algorithmic statements, procedural statements, uh, which he inherited from uh, Alan Turing. Um, Actually, all the way, not just Alan Turing, yeah. all the way from Panini. Oh, that's true, Panini and Alan Turing together, yeah. So this is peculiar because in, in uh, sciences like physics, laws are stated in declarative, declarative terms. So everything attracts everything else, you know, and you have this idea is not a, is not a rule. It's not a procedure. It's a statement of irregularity, a constraint, positive constraint or negative constraint doesn't really matter. So we are focusing not on the distinction between rules and constraints, but on the, the, the law part, that which is neutral, not the computational algorithm part. Um, this continued from uh, the sound pattern of English, this way of the Paninian or the Aaron Turingian mode continued all the way till uh, about, I would say, the uh, about the end of 70s, when early 80s, right, yes. early 80s, early yeah. 80s when, it's when shifted. there were also constraints, there were rules and constraints, and people felt this is overkill. You, yeah, overkill meaning you can't have both yeah. rules and constraints because they are rules as stateable as constraints and constraints are stateable as rules, yeah. so you shouldn't allow both. Yeah. That's, the, that's why the overkill. Yeah. And one of the characteristics of rules is that they apply one after the other in a sequence, in a kind of derivation, like you could say in a mathematical derivation, but mathematical derivation is not ordered. The linguistic rules are in, in phonology as well. They are, they are ordered rules. What does ordering do? Uh, so because of this worry that it is overkill, I think it was in Berkeley, there was a conference. The early, I think it was 18, yeah. 82. Something like that. Early yeah. 82, yeah. Yeah. Um, or maybe later. Berkeley yeah. conference was, was 82. Uh, 86, 87, oh, okay. something like that. Uh, yeah. We, okay. But we are not quite clear about the... <laughs> <laughs> we don't remember yeah. because there were two such conferences. Yeah. A large number of phonologists came together to, to explore the possibility of uh, phonology without ordered rules, uh, quite a few of them, and the, we were actually part of that uh, that revolution. And the idea was to state everything in terms of constraints. But then we discovered that when we moved from rules to constraints, there was something that we were keeping together. How do we translate rule ordering into a system of constraints? Now, ordering the uh, uh, rule ordering was necessary uh, because it allowed you to resolve certain uh, conflicts. So yeah. conflict resolution was another yeah. sort of idea that ran through all of this. Um, and you might understand it if we say that rule ordering does the same thing as um, ranking or strength assignment mm. in OT. Yeah. Right? That's, that's a bad Yeah. So let, let, let's take a simple example. You could say, if you take the word writing, W-R-I-T-I-N-G, there are two things that you can say about it. One is to say that uh, the, the ter sound is voiceless. That's one. But then you also say that in between vowels, in an unstressed syllable in American English, uh, it's, it, it is realized as a flap. Not so as there's a, a, yeah, not as as a, a tap. Yeah. Yeah. So a, rider. Rider, rider. Right. Yeah. In, in, in at the phonetic level, it is actually a, a, a voiced. Uh, so there's a conflict between these two statements. This is voiceless and this is voiced. How do you resolve these things? Okay. And this became an important uh, question. Rule ordering, it was fairly simple. Uh, there were various ways of resolving this in the constraint uh, idea, what Tara referred to as uh, non-monotonicity. in the uh, computational yeah. diagram yeah. or defeasible logic, non-monotonic logic or defeasible logic in the formal logic systems. Uh, the idea was that there is kind of priority assignment and this could be in terms of constraint ranking as it happens in optimality theory or in terms of strength assignment in uh, some version defe like defeasibility logic and there are some some empirical differences, but we are not going to go into the details of these different formalisms. The basic idea here is that there is conflict resolution in rule ordering, constraint ranking, strength assignment, all of them. 
the is other aspect, there is another aspect. No, is it a good idea to give the, uh, the uh, conflict resolution with rider and rider, rider and rider? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should, instead of using Canadian English, we should choose uh, an example from Malayalam, for example. Okay. Okay. So in Malayalam, there is this, these two words which uh, pronounce slowly without, you know, uh, in, in a formal in a formal way. way uh, one one word is mantan with a t, and the other is manden with a d. Man, mantan. Well, this is not the way you normally pronounce it, um, but doesn't matter. Is uh, uh, a fat one. Manden is a slow one, but in actual speech, in, in regular speech, it comes out as manden manden. Both are voiced, and this is because the after nasal, the voiceless stop becomes voiced. However, the distinction between the two is retained because there is another rule which says, rule of constraint, it says that after a voiced consonant, there's a kind of vowel on glide. So after there, as in there, there. Yeah, actually, man, then, and man, then. There. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and the thing is that uh, no speaker of Malayalam would mistake one for the other. Yeah. In fact, if you asked uh, speakers of Malayalam, are they saying the or the, they will insist. That they're saying ta. Ta in man, 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 yeah. Yeah. Ambalam, they'll say it is a word that they're saying. They will not hear the voice sound. Yeah, <laughs> right, even in uh, English. Yeah. yeah. So in rule ordering, this is very simple because what you do is you do the vowel on glide first and then you voice. So when the on, on glide rule happens, the the is still voiceless and after that it becomes voiced. Perfectly fine. How do you do this in terms of constraint ranking? That these things become slightly problematic. Now, in the Berkeley conference that we suggested, one of the ideas was that, uh, in addition to uh, defeasible logic and so on, you have three kinds of rules, so actually two kinds. One, rules or constraints that apply at a given level or given dimension of representation, and so you could have constraints on the phonological level or the phonetic level. There are you know, two different ways of doing it. And then you could also have constraints that connect the two. So you could say, if the phonological representation is such and such, then the phonetic representation is such and such. Now, if you include this as well, you can take care of a large number of cases of uh, rule ordering in terms of constraints. So two, two general ideas about interaction between rules. One is to factor it out in terms of defeasibility and the other is in terms of uh, where the rules apply, across levels or within a level. Actually, it's uh, two different strategies to take care of the same problem, yeah. the problem being con uh, a conflict. So uh, two different ways of resolving the conflict. Yeah. And if you do it that way, uh, phonological theory becomes like any theory in science. Okay. We will state the laws governing representations. I, I, I don't think the, uh, the kind of controversy, should we have rules or constraints, is still quite resolved. That's an ongoing, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. unless you are within a particular bandwagon yeah. that, that subscribes to yeah. one or the other. Yeah. Right. But we won't talk about the details or any yeah. particular theory. We just pose these questions right. because it's important for graduate students to engage with these questions. It is not for us, like senior citizens, to do that kind of research. We are not going to do that. But we hope the graduate students will be able to look at some of these issues and, and, and resolve some yeah. of them, maybe. Yeah. The kinds of things that we were not able to do, you should be able to do now. That's the idea. Okay. Uh, is, this, that, is that a good time to? Yeah, start? let's, let's All right. do that. Yeah. Okay, we have uh, done our second uh, video part. So if there is any question, we'll take at this point. So, uh, no question yet.
so we have one question from the previous session uh, which before we continue with that we started the second part of the video so uh and Tara, do you want to take that question at the end that that's fine um, right we can we can put it at the end more question from okay in the needle i'll put it here Yeah, so here is a question from Indranil. In my understanding, and question me if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, constraints, however, do state certain universal generalizations that rules don't really, really capture. Do ordered rules represent any universal property? Yeah, well, whether it is rules or constraints, you could say that some of them are universal rules or some of them are language particular. The, the issue, the difference between universal versus language particular is orthogonal to the rule versus constraint uh, uh, distinction. Uh, of course, OT takes the view that all rules are at least classical OT took the view that all constraints are universal and the differences across languages are taken care of in terms of ranking and other kinds of phenomena. But this is not, really necessary to take that extreme view. You could say that uh, uh, many constraints slash rules are universal. Some of them are uh, recurrent. They, they apply in large number of languages, but not necessarily in all languages. And some are really, really language specific. And this is how, in fact, if you look at biological organization, that's, that's how it happens. Some of, the, some of the biological laws, if you wish, are specific to a species, others are found in you know, uh, higher general taxon and yet others across uh, living all the species. So this is, a, this, is a, this is an orthogonal question, orthogonal in the sense like this can be how much of it is universal, how much of it is language specific is still up for grabs. Of course, our goal is to derive everything from universal principles. Uh, but in order to do that, we may have to do some uh, some gymnastics. <laughs> in it may not be feasible in all cases. Right. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, there is another question from Nasim Khan, and his question is: What is the procedure to name the constraints which are not found in the universal inventory, and what is the methodology followed for the identification of different constraints in a language? Two um, we just have to accept that in the course of uh, evolution of language, as in the case of evolution of living organisms, there are very specific rules that happen to particular languages. So, for example, the the, the rule that uh, gives you uh, past tense uh, irregular irregular past tense in English, if you want to state it that way, are not found in any other language. They're specific to English. There are many rules in Malayalam, for example, that are hardly ever found in, in uh, other languages. There are rules in Malayali English which I have not seen in any other language. You cannot simply close your eyes against such existence of such things. You have to say they're part of the grammar of the language in question. Uh, even though universality is a good thing, uh, that may not be the case, as I said. The only methodology, if you want, is to say, OK, these are the rules of the particular grammar, not universal. There is no other methodology. Yeah, and I think in uh, like in classical optimality theory, the the constraints are generally created based on the scenario, the observation. And if no existing constraint serves the purpose, a new constraint may be developed yeah. there. Right? Yeah, that's how it moves there. Yeah. Um, at this moment, there is no other clarification. Uh, clarificatory question coming. So, I mean, we, we can yeah. go ahead with the next part yeah. and maybe more questions will come there. Okay. Uh, let's now talk about representations and representation systems. Uh, it's, this is probably particular 
deeply relevant in linguistics more than any other science where you have representations and i mean we can actually see uh, rules or constraints as being the expressions of regularities in representations yeah. which is why representations and uh, and uh, representational systems are so central to linguistic theory uh, so we don't state the laws directly on the entities out there. We represent sentences and words, and then we state the regularities of the laws on those representations. So this is the way linguistics has always has, it, yeah. has developed ever yeah. since fifty six. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we begin with let's see the, the uh, school. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, so before that, you had the IPA. Right. This is for the representation of uh, categories of phonological segments. Okay. So you, you say something like the word bit bit has three segments, and we have to classify b, classify e, classify t. Right. And you call b a voiced yeah. uh, bilabial closet. Yeah. And uh, so, and within this system, you have a way of uh, describing or representing vowels, and another way for consonants. Yeah. So that's that's the IP you're all familiar yeah, with. Yeah, but these are the, the vowel description and the consonant description, they were completely unrelated. Um, it was the Prague School, Schubertskoy and Group. And Jakobsen, yeah. And who first yeah. suggested another way of looking at it, and that is in terms of the distinctive feature systems that we are all familiar with now, right? And this started uh, in the late 40s, late 50s. Not Sorry, here. late forties. Yeah, and we are not good at no, no. years anyway. No, but but the before the, the before late, SPE anyway. Yeah. No, no, it's not just it's long before SPE. It was the Jakobsen van Tale paper in the early fifties. Yeah, that, this, this is the that, yeah the famous. That's right. Yeah, the idea here was that when you say something like voiced, voiceless, or bilabial, labial, dental, etc., you're talking about categories of. Uh, segments, phonological segments. Yes, yeah, so when you have a feature like so, features and feature values. When you say that you have a feature like voice, uh, and its values are plus and minus, then you're saying there are two categories of sounds: yeah. the uh, plus voice and the minus voice. Yeah. So, in, in in that sense, distinctive features are really a system of classification. Classification. In contrast, if you go to IPA, there is this. Uh, let's say a parameter of place of articulation is the dimension and there are let's say seven or eight multi-valued it's not binary valued that's that's how the uh, ipa system worked and the descriptions there were yeah. the three term labels yeah, yeah. Okay. but now from from the idea of classifying segments this this was an important idea that it was seen that segments are composed of these features and feature values so the, the first sound in bit is composed of plus voice, plus labial, etc. This is actually categorization in, you know, in, in seen as compositionality, which is very interesting. Right. And that yeah. continued till, I mean, there were minor refinements of the uh, distinctive feature system, but that generally continued up to SPE when rules became important in phonology. It was but SPE continued that in SPE the, the rules apply to a string. Yeah. String of segments. Just one one string. Um, so should we talk about the the the, the nonlinear structure, like yeah. syllable structure, or should we go to yeah, things before, like before that just one main uh, point, the distinction between IPA and the distinctive feature system. The distinctive feature system allowed a kind of cross classification, yeah. um, cross categorization that IPA didn't allow. And that was extremely useful for stating a huge bunch of regularities that you find, patterns that you find yeah. in uh, the sound systems of languages. Yeah. Quite often, people teach IP and distinctive feature system as though IPA is phonetic and distinctive feature is phonological. Oh, yes. No, they're both phonological and they both try to express ways of articulating what is distinctive about a segment, what distinguishes one segment from the other segments. And this is supposed to be universal. And this is partly because IPA is seen as, on the one hand, as the symbols. Yeah, right, right. the different sounds. Yeah. You have to memorize the IPA yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And on the other, 
the, the system underlying it, what it is meant for, that gets forgotten. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. So that's uh, um, so should we should we now go to this segment internal structure and feature geometry or should we go to things like no, actually again before oh, that okay the in the distinctive feature system had an influence on syntax because that's how in the early very early 70s you had a classification of words words uh, word classes were seen in terms of plus minus n and plus, that is plus minus noun and plus minus v for plus minus verb yeah. and you had a four-way class uh, you know, yeah. cla categorization of so, words so classification of words versus classification of segments from phonology to syntax it's the same idea this, this came out in chomsky's remarks on normalization the plus minus yeah. noun and plus minus verb stuff yeah we're just trying to connect phonology and syntax Okay. Um, so actually, um, right. Uh, after that comes the what what's known as nonlinear phonology. Yeah. Is a metrical bunch of phonology. A bunch different. of things that happen yeah. with that. Metrical phonology, or to say, metal phonology. Uh, this, uh, so the, in terms of phenomena, you had um, syllable structure, right? Which uh, and and generalizations in terms of syllables rather than just the string of sounds um, and then came stress and analysis of stress uh, perspective on stress that was very different and through light and again a whole bunch of things uh, where um, you know things yeah. like auto 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 yeah. and there was auto segmenting yeah. phonology and then came McCarthy's uh, Arabic yeah. Yeah. Where he, he separated the tiers of vowels and of consonants and how they aligned. Yeah. And, and this is probably where, for the was that for the first time that you had, I mean, they weren't seen in terms of these, this terminology, but you had the formation rules, the constraints, or, or rules or constraints on the string, yeah. uh, but you also had the correspondences. And, or right. alignments between vowels and consonants, for example. And at the same time, there was also tones, how they were, uh, the suprasegmentals and the segmentals being aligned. This, that, they, uh, I yeah. think this may be slightly difficult to understand without yeah. some, some details. Drawings. So let's take something like syllable structure. Yeah. Until Khan came up with the idea of syllable structure, there was just a string. And Khan suggested on top of the, the, the phonological segment segments, that string. There's a syllable structure where you could say that a syllable consists of, let's say, an onset and a rhyme. This, this is not necessarily the terminology that can't use, doesn't matter. Now, this is a statement about the rules of syllable structure on top of the segment. Rules string. or uh, what he uh, gave was a template of a syllable. Right. But the template can be, you know, unpacked Same. into formation rules. How do you construct syllables? A syllable consists of on, optional onset and obligatory rhyme. A rhyme consists of an obligatory nucleus and an optional coda and other things. How many segments in the coda, how many segments in the onset, how it is structured and so on. And then, you, of course, you also have the segment structure rules, internal to. So, for example, you could have rules like if you have, uh, if you have plus nasal, it must be plus voiced, that kind of stuff. These are segment structure rules. And then, so these are two different uh, dimensions of representation. And there are rules which say that the nucleus can be filled only with sonorant segments. This is the correspondence rules between the syllable structure and the segment structure. This is the way such uh, structure was seen, correspondence rules and formation rules. And yeah, and so you started having multi-tiered or multi-dimensional yeah. representations. And as these representations were seen as being more and more complex, more pieces got added to representations. The burden of uh, capturing regularities in some sense shifted from yeah. the rule systems to the representation yeah. systems. Right? Yeah. That's and the there was another, actually we should talk about the CD, the skeletal, skeletal structure. structure. So prior to this time, the idea was that segments were represented in that string. But then segmenthood of segments was factored out separately as what is called skeleton. The, at that time, the idea was that 
It could be CV, 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 or it could be X, 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 where X represented segment. Now, what is the, what are the internal, what are the uh, properties of these Xs? Then you would say that into, in terms of feature structure. So plus or minus voice, etc. Uh, and the features actually told you whether there would be a C or an, a V. Yeah. And also, C and V followed in some sense from the position in yeah. the syllable. Yeah. So if it is part of the nucleus, it's a V. If it is part of the onset of coda, it's a C. That's all. So it's so, enough so to say. X. Yeah, C and V did not mean consonant at yeah. all anymore. Yeah. So. Syllabic versus non syllabic. These are actually structural properties rather than feature. And then came this idea of feature geometry, which said, instead of having a flat structure for the segment internal structure, that is also hierarchical. Uh, we will not probably go into the no, details. We, want we won't have time to do all that stuff. Yeah. But essentially to point out that there were lots of uh, ideas which came out at that time, during that time, about the nature of representations, the structure of representation, the different, different pieces of information are factored out that also had significant consequences to the way you state what the rules are like. And it was a lot of fun being in the middle of yeah, that, right? Yeah. So it was, yes, yeah. it was a, actually a very delightful time in linguistics yeah. because new ideas were coming up. Yeah. Morris's course on metrical phonology and civil sector was Absolutely. in 78, which was, yeah. A lot of research came out of that single course that he offered. Okay, so uh, shall we stop for Let's stop. Yeah. Um, for comments yeah. and questions? All right. Uh, so we have one question here. So Sharmishta asks, what kind of qualitative distinctions are available in the idea of underlying representation and OT specific idea of input? Um, that's a somewhat technical question, so let me rephrase it as just two different types of information um, about so-called, uh, uh, how do I put it? Okay, at some point, if you take a, a word like div divine and related to divinity, you need to express the relation between these two related words, divine and divinity. To express that relation between these two, you have to set up some kind of representation. Uh, and that level of representation is obviously distinct from the uh, what you actually hear when you say divine and divinity. So you need some kind of rules to state the connection be between these two levels of representation. And the position that uh, SP took was that you just have this, what earlier people called the morphophonemic level of representation and the phonetic level of representation. And there was then subsequently, there was a question, do you need something else to express some other type of information? So let's think about these things as types of information. In syntax, this is like, yeah. Can I just, mm. can I just interrupt for a moment? So here, the, the, the uh, reason for this is, how do you relate divine yeah. and divine? Yeah, the I D relation. That's there. OK. Just in uh, This is kind of similar to how do you relate the structures, the active and passive structures, like John saw Mary and Mary was seen by John. What happens here is there is something that is constant between these two structures, namely, in jo whether it is John saw Mary or Mary was seen by John, John is the one who sees and Mary is the one who is seen. So that you have to express that in some fashion. And you you call it theta role representation, whatever in in uh, early syntax it was called underlying representation, and those, those things disappeared subsequently. And you also have to say that John is a subject in John saw Mary, but Mary is a subject in Mary was seen by John. That's a different kind of representation. So as syntax progressed, these different kinds of information, it became clear that they are not exactly the same. So you had to have some uh, way of representing different dimensions of representation, different levels of representation. So the information got factored out. Uh, this is exactly what happened in the case of uh, phonology, like the syllable structure information and the segment structure information got factored out. The tonal information got factored out. Stress became different and so on. 
precisely the same thing was what was happening to the so-called underlying representation, which the, the, the role of which was to express relations between words. OK. So uh, I would, I would um, just put it that way without going into the technical details of OT, the, the, the formal ways of expressing these ideas, uh, because it will take huge amount of time. And also, we need to illustrate it with the blackboard. We cannot say this in speech. Some of these things we had actually articulated in the 24-page document. We could also pick it up if, uh, if necessary. We could, if uh, uh, more discussion is needed, uh, we will respond to questions in, in some kind of written form with diagrams and rules and all the gory details. The gory details are not you know, stateable in, in, a, in this form of speech. So I would stick to the, you know, the ideas rather than the, the formalisms. There are umpteen formalisms that are available to us. I'm not saying that formalisms are not important, but less important than the basic ideas. Um, Mo, we have another question from Anjali who says, what was the empirical motivation for an underlying representation for a segment when it was first posited in phonological theory? Yeah, I remember there was a, <laughs> yeah. Uh, this, is a, this is an important question. In fact, I remember a graduate student was asked this question, why do you need underlying representation? And yeah. quite often, yeah. you know, graduate students are stumped by a statement, uh, by a question like that. The need for underlying representation in the SPE type of phonology was to express relatedness of words. As I said, we need to express the relation between divine and divinity. This was not the case in phonological representation in, in the classical phonemics. Uh, this is the same case in syntax. As I said, you know, you need to express the relation between uh, active and passive or cleft and non-cleft and WH you know, construction and non wh different kinds of constructions in, in syntax. And the same thing applies to different kinds of constructions in morphology, different kinds of constructions in morphophonology. So that was a motivation. And this is our linguist work. When we have to express something, you use either representations or rules. And you play with these two things. And sometimes mm -hmm. if you overemphasize one of them, things get very complicated. So you go back to the drawing board and do it all over again. These yeah, are the so, two things that we're given, representation so two, and, and constraints. Yeah, that are. The two things that uh, underlying representations do, one mm -hmm. is to express the relatedness of words, where the relatedness sort of gets obscured by the time you get to the phonetic level. And the other is to express the contrasts in the language. So you don't have a contrast between the aspirated uh, stops and the unaspirated ones in English. And, but you want to express the relatedness and the regularities in those relations. And that, so that was another reason for yeah. underlying representations. Yeah. Yes. Right. right. Um, we have one more from Vijay, who says, you, nostalg you nostalgically mentioned the delightful times of churning of ideas when so much was happening. Do you think phonology has stagnated, especially since the advent of OT? <laughs> That is not a question we should actually answer because no, I don't think we should address that question. No, here's the reason why most people feel that the best time were when they were graduate students or when they were assistant professors. And when you become full professors and you reach our age, we feel, oh, the world is decaying. The best time was when we were young. So, but this is simply a part of you know old age. Yeah. I, this, this impression may be true, we can't say so. We don't want to express sure. these subjective opinions because we have gray hair. This is uh, for the students. Answer. Right. All right. I, I think that's the uh, end of the questions for this round. So, um, Somdev, uh, shall we continue? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, uh, let, let us move All on right. to the next part then. Sure. <clears throat> Okay, so we come to the third major component of a um, 
linguistic model, let's say, which is the aspect of modularity. What are the modules of grammar? How are they related? And so on. And yeah. even within a module, you might have sub-modules. So what, what does that look like? Yeah. So, so the word module may be uh, perhaps a little confusing for uh, linguistic students. Basic idea is that the human mind consists of different modules. So for example, there is a module of vision, which is you know uh, located roughly in certain areas of the brain. And there is a module that is responsible for making decisions, which is in the prefrontal cortex and so on. So that both the human brain and the human mind are, are organized in terms of modules. And these modules are internally, there is some degree of autonomy, but it is partial autonomy. They also interact. And this is probably why we are so sort of habituated into yeah. putting everything into a box. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. But this is an important idea in, in, in linguistics. So if you look at the syntactic structures, there's a module of phrase structure rules. Transformational. Transformation yeah. rules, and there is a lexicon. And these are the way that these are the ways of organizing the grammar, okay, as far as linguistics is concerned. And in if you look at classical phonemics, there were two kinds of rules. There was the morphophonemic rules. And we are not going to go into the details of that, but we assume that everybody knows what these words mean. And there is the allophonic rules. So a rule such as, let us say, that the, the voiceless plosives are aspirated at the beginning of a stressed syllable. So in P-I-T, pit, the per is aspirated, but in S-P-I-T, spit, the per is not aspirated. That is supposed to be an allophonic rule. But in contrast, uh, you say something like, if you attach iti to something like divine, the I becomes e. That's a morphophonemic rule. So divine, divinity, divinity. rapid, rapidity, yeah. so all of those, yes. Yeah. Um, so these two are seen as two distinct types of rules. And so there is a, in classical phonemics, there was a morphophonemic level of representation. And there is a phonological classical phonemic level of representation. And there is the phonetic level of representation. There are three levels of representation. So this is when uh, you have, might be useful to think in, in terms of two things. You have modules like phonology and semantics and syntax and so on, um, very broadly. And then within each of these, you have the phonemic level and the phonetic level. Yeah. The, uh, in syntax, you would have the functional level and the category <laughs> level or whatever. Right? And so this is it's in, in the when you talk about modularity that the idea of levels of representation and dimensions of representation and so on um, enter into the picture. Yeah. So in classical classical phonemics, there was the two types of rules. A rule which changes one phoneme to another phoneme, that was a morphophonemic rule. And a rule that changes a phoneme to its allophone, that's a allophonic rule. And uh, when uh, Chomsky and Halle came to scene, they demonstrated that this kind of organization was uh, undesirable. We, we're not going to state the arguments, but it's a very powerful argument that the in-between level of representation, classical phonemic representation, uh, resulted in duplication of the same generalization, one as a morphophonemic rule and the other one as an you know, allophonic rule. So that intermediate level was abandoned and there was the so-called morphophonemic level was called the underlying representation and the phonetic representation. There were only two uh, levels of representation. Yeah, and the two levels were related by phonological rules. Phonological rules. And the phonological rules were sensitive to morphological information. There, there was no distinction between two types of rules, just phonological rules. Some of them happened to be sensitive to, to morphological information, others were not. That's all. Um, this uh, was challenged in the uh, late 70s. We, the, we brought back the, some intuition of the classical phonemic level of representation by saying some of the rules apply in the lexicon and the outcome, the output of the rules that apply in the lexicon were called lexical level of representation. And then there were the post-lexical uh, application of rules. The same rule system, it was not two types of rules. The same rule system, but just the modularity changed. But without you, that kind of duplication yeah. so, that you had earlier. Right. Yeah. 
So the argument that uh, SP advanced against classical phonemics did not apply. And the, there was another aspect to this uh, modularity distinction that the, the main claim that was being made was that uh, speakers of a language are conscious of the outcome of the lexical rules, but they're not conscious of the outcome of the, uh, the, the post lexical rules. So this is yeah. why, for example, we mentioned uh, uh, Malayalam speaker, you know, we, we mentioned tempo, uh, a Malayalam speaker of English, a Malayali, of Malayali English would say temple with, with a bird, bird, but think that they're saying bird, uh, and hear it as bird. Now that is some, when you could think of it as what the speaker is conscious of. Right. Yeah. So, speaker's intuition, if yeah. you wish. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, there was lots of argument about the so-called psychological reality of you know, phonological representations and its its relation to things like speech errors and language game, not language games, the, the play languages and so on. Uh, and various... Errors, language, er yeah. language errors. Yeah. Uh, I do have to point out that this idea actually was inspired by the same move in syntax, yeah. where uh, you had, for example, in the uh, early 70s with Chomsky's remarks on nominaliz nominalization. Um, the, until then, the idea was that anything, that there was something called the lexicon, and the lexicon contained everything that was idiosyncratic. Now, it was only in the early 70s that that changed, and um, the idea came that you could have regularities in the lexicon. You could actually have rules in the lexicon. Yeah. So, so yeah. Chomsky suggested that the relation between, let us say, destroy and destruction was expressed in the module of the lexicon. So the lexicon was no longer a, a storehouse of irregular uh, idiosyncrasies. Uh, so derivation of morphology happened in the lexicon. And from taking off from that, uh, in syntax, for example, in lexical functional grammar, uh, it was shown that the, the um, passive morphology, the passive, um, well, it, it was not really a rule, but passive morphology, which was so directly connected to syntax, had to happen in yeah. the lexicon. Hence, the lexical functional yeah. grammar. So things like passive, causative, there was lexical causative, lexical passive, lexical applicative, all these things took place in the module of the lexicon. So in Malayalam, for example, the relation between Urangi slept and Uraki made to sleep. Caused to sleep. Yeah. Or put Caused to sleep. sleep. Put yeah. to sleep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Odi, Odi Pichu, etc. etc. These are these are causatives. This is morphological uh, causatives. With a direct impact on syntax. Yeah. Uh, and these were part of the lexicon. Yeah. So the relation between Urangi and Uraki na to ka, this this had to happen in the lexicon. So this was in the mid seventies and inspired that move to the lexical level of representation in phonology. Yeah. This was one of the motivations for lexical. one aspect of lexical phonology. There are different motivations for some of the ideas in lexical phonology, but the so-called psychological reality of, uh, of uh, phonological representation was one of the motivations. And this is independent of the uh, rule versus constraint, the, the procedural versus declarative uh, formalisms and so on. So everything in lexical phonology can be in fact translated into constraints, it doesn't make a difference. Yeah, actually uh, a lot of these um, controversies about whether it be about representations or about rules versus constraints or whether you need a particular module or not, um, these are sometimes quite trivial yeah. and if you look at the substance of these, if the, the theoretical substance behind these yeah. uh, without being locked into any particular wholesale theory, yeah. um, it becomes much easier to yeah. see the substance behind yeah. it. Yeah. So uh, one thing we should we should point out is even though we have been talking, we are both phonologists, we are primary interest in phonology. I'm not so, a phonologist. Okay, all right, whatever. I'm not a phonologist either. I no. was a phonologist once upon a time. Yeah. So I, I wrote a syntax thesis from a phonologist's yeah. perspective. Yeah, and I declare myself as a non-phonologist. <laughs> but okay. the past, okay. Yeah. Um, 
we have been talking in terms of theoretical phonology, but it also applies to theoretical, theoretical phonetics, linguistic phonetics. And some of these so-called post-lexical rules are actually not category changing rules, but uh, quantitative rules. So for example, bar length when you, know, when you have a, a voiced consonant versus a voiceless consonant, when you have a fricative versus non-fricative, et cetera. There are interesting, you know, interesting uh, rules about or laws about bar length. And the, the, the rule about uh, the on glide that we mentioned earlier after the voiced consonant. These are all uh, not category changing rules, but category adjusting, the quantitative rules. And there's this uh, question, uh, what is the nature of phonetic representation? Is phonetic representation um, purely discrete? That can you do segment one, segment two, segment three, etc. And within segment, there are no differences. It became fairly clear very soon, but you know, when phonologists and phoneticians, the lab phoneticians started interacting, that the earlier conception of phonetic representation in terms of strings of discrete segments, that was no longer possible. There were no segments in phonetic representation. We, we are not going to go into the details once again. Except that, that. just to say that there were a lot of transitions yeah. and many of these transitions yeah. between so-called segments were important and you really didn't know where one segment ended yeah. and the next one began. Yeah. So this is also tied up with the problems of segmenting speech. So P R I N C E. There's a T between N and S, but that T is different from P R I N T S, and you can hear the difference. This is a durational matter. There were a large number of questions, and the questions still continue about you know problems of segmenting speech in a universal fashion. You have to know the language in order to be able to segment the you know, speech. And segmentation, at the phonetic level of representation, it is probably not the case that they are in terms of discrete segments. And of course, uh, the whole um, thing becomes, uh, the whole issue becomes even more problematic if you also look at the supra segment yeah. So, yeah. yeah. We, we won't even <laughs> touch that. <laughs> we'll leave it to the yeah. experts for that. Yeah. Also, so we should leave a lot of stuff for graduate students, not the experts. I'm talking about the beginners okay. because they have, you know, whole life again, you know, to find out to find out things that uh, we found problematic. So, but our job is to point to the problems that we have not been able to solve. Okay. Um, so, okay, is this so a good time to for yeah. questions and yeah. comments? Clarificatory, actually, clarificatory no questions. Clarificatory yeah. questions. Yes. All right, so once again, we are back for the clarificatory questions, but so far there is none. Uh, oh, just yes. one coming in, yeah. 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 So let me place it here. Yes, this is from Paroma from IIT Delhi. Uh, your example of Malayalam pre-nasal voicing and the same as a morphophonemic rule in Maithilam. How does this align with the different psychological realities for allophonic and morphophonemic rules? Hmm. Uh, the the postnasal voicing would have been uh, expressed as morphophonemic in classical phonemics, but it is not sensitive to morphology at all. It's a purely phonological rule, and uh, and classical phonemics didn't have a place for such things. So they they mixed up morphologically sensitive and phoneme changing rules. Uh, so in, in uh, current phonology, you will simply say this is a purely phonological rule. It, it is not sensitive to morphological information. The other rule that we mentioned, namely the, the uh, schwa on glide after a voiced sound, that's, what, uh, that's something that the uh, classical phonemicist would also regard as an allophonic rule because it doesn't change the phonemic status of the vowel. It just adds something to it. So these are both purely phonological rules, uh, but they apply in such a way that the contrast is maintained not in the, in the consonant, but in the following vowel. And there are many things of that kind. Um, so to, to give you an example, there is a, there are, there's a minimal pair, a, ta, p, which means uh, lid in Malayalam, and a, 
to per, which means uh, oven. And in fast speech, the vowel, the, the a and the u in between the t and the per disappear. And what you get is simply a da, which is in between two vowels, the t becomes a da. And the vowel completely disappears, and the da and the per are put together. There is no vowel, but the, the vowel quality remains on the consonant. You can hear the difference. These are all difficult uh, phenomena for, uh, well, these are difficult phenomena not only for classical phonemics, but also for you know the kind of uh, phonetic representations that we uh, assume that phonetic representations are strings of discrete segments. They create problems. Uh, the phenomena of this kind create problems for those assumptions, which is why we mentioned uh, the nature, the conception of phonetic representations will have to change dramatically. They're not the same as what we thought they were in, you know, in the uh, several years ago. So to, to, to go back uh, to the psychological reality part, uh, people, the, the uh, speakers of the language are not aware that this is what they're doing. They, they happen below the level of consciousness. So the psychological reality for this will be the people would insist they are saying per, not ba, even though they are actually saying ba. And this is most clear in Malayali English. In fact, I, I find it very hard to convince a Malayali that when they say temple, they're saying a ba. They will insist, no, 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 I'm not saying a ba, I'm saying a pa. Can't you hear? Temple, temple, pa. This is a very interesting phenomenon. So, so is it a free variation situation or uh, they're in like... It's not a free variation. Like, okay. The, the typical Malayali English is the per becomes ber after the nasal. Okay. So it is a, it, yeah. it is a conditional scenario. Yeah, yeah. It's only in extremely... In Malayali English, I don't think most, you know, the kind of English that I learned from my teachers were temple. Mm -hmm. Not and it, it took me a lot of effort to change the bird to per when you know I learned that that is not how it happens native speech. Yeah, the opposite case also happens that we introduce distinctions which we think are important, but I won't go into those details yet. Um, Mo, we have uh, another question from. Oramita Mitra, who asks, when L1 rules constraints influence L2 phonology, like in your example of temple versus mm -hmm. temple in Malayali English, how are these ordered or ranked with respect to the existing rules in the L2? This okay, is the second like, part. Uh, but, uh, yeah, later. This, we have a, <laughs> instead of responding to that question, we'll simply say we have a fairly, it's a 40 or 50 page article in the OT, in the Rutgers archives on Malayali English. How to, the, the we compare OT and non-OT and various kinds of things, and how these how these rules come into existence. That was our in, that was our preoccupation. Uh, so, to give you an example, uh, Malayali is pronounced the word P I T with an alveolar consonant, alveolar T, but P U T is post is a slightly retroflex or so post alveolar consonant, pit and put. The same thing happens in the case of. Uh, uh, you know, so for example, V E R Y very and W O R W O R R Y worry. In fact, in my own speech, I make a distinction between R and R in English, and it is extremely hard for me as a speaker of Malayali English. I cannot pronounce the two in the same way. It's almost like it, it, it tears my heart to pronounce them exactly the same way. The same thing about P U L L and P I L L. The, it's one is uh, alveolar, the other is retroflex. Mm -hmm. the, this doesn't exist in Malayalam. This doesn't exist in English. It exists only in Malayali English. So the question is, how come these rules come to exist in Malayali English, which is not from either of these two languages? And we have a kind of story which, uh, for which we'll ask you, know, you to go and read the uh, Rutgers. It's a very detailed analysis but then we should say that uh, this this is malayali english of how many years ago tara about at least 30 40 years ago right no no not 40 at least 30 years ago uh, we can see that the malayali english has been evolving because of tv and stuff like that so this is an old variety of malayali english perhaps not not true anymore i don't know 
Yeah, but but the point here is also that um, it's not enough to look at the uh, constraints in English or in Malayalam, but you need to actually develop a grammar of the uh, yeah. you know of Malayali English or whichever English or whichever yeah. um, the two languages. I mean the combined thing. Yeah. Is, uh, the old ideas of transfer and stuff like that, interference, don't work yeah. in this case. You have to treat it as, a, as an independent, autonomous yeah. variety in itself. Yeah. 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 It's almost like realization. Okay. Actually, uh, Aramida has uh, uh, another question, which you know, a little bit of that has come in this question. Like the full question is like, uh, is there a principled way in which rules uh, or constraints interact across the languages of a bilingual speaker? Um, we think so, but uh, we worked only on this one variety of uh, this Malayali English. So to answer that question, I think graduate students have to work on similar cases. Let's say Indian Englishes are a fantastic lab for that. So rather than asking us, you guys should be doing the work. So uh, we are talking about the work that we did 30 years ago. You should be doing you know, work on uh, Bengali English and Tamil English and whatever. No, this work was done about 20, uh, 15 years ago. But based on um, our uh, notions of Malayali English from 30 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so we should be asking you those questions rather than you asking us those questions. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, shall we move to the, uh, the, la the last part? Yeah, yeah the, last, the last bit. Right. Right. All right. Okay. So we now come to the uh, fifth and final part of. Uh, this is it a fifth or sixth? It's a Somewhere. fifth. It's okay. a fifth. Yeah, yeah, I can't count. Doesn't matter. Yeah, you could never count. So, all right. So, uh, this is the fifth part, and uh, something that we need to say at this point. This this was supposed to be pulling all the pieces together. Um, we do it. We'll try to do something like that. But um, before that, given that this was a kind of spontaneous conversation. Um, we didn't have slides and I don't think we, it, it doesn't make sense to put slides in, um, but what we will do is we will send out a written version, more elaborate written version, especially because we mentioned formalisms and notations, uh, we mentioned examples, but uh, and some of those things are difficult to understand unless you see them, um, yeah. you know. In a PDF file. Yeah. yeah. So we'll send a PDF yeah. uh, document, a yeah. uh, more detailed one. In so, that, we'll also make some connections to syntax and other things. Yeah. And, that we, uh, yeah. But we depend on how it comes out when no, we write it. No, I think it. we should do that. We will, yeah. but yeah. we don't know how it will come out when we write it. Look, but whenever I say something about linguistics, I talk about physics. And, that's uh, true. Yes. So it's bound to happen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah. uh, I think we will leave the pulling the pieces together part of it for that document. Yeah. And for now, uh, is there something that you want to say by way of summing up? And, you know, yeah, I think I think we began by saying that it is important to distinguish between the leading theoretical ideas and theoretical questions based on those ideas and the details of implementation, the conceptual aspects. Uh, then we talked about the formalisms, important, but not as important as the conceptual issues. Uh, and then the notation, which is least important. It's a matter of you know, saying. Actually, I don't yeah. know if you can say the notation is least important. Hmm. It might be least important, but it, it is still important. Because, uh, I mean, imagine if you use notation without knowing what it means. Ah, that is terrible. Yeah. That's like using the Arabic numeral system without knowing what it means. You know? Of course, yeah, to that extent. Yeah. But in this hierarchy, the least important, let's say. Okay. Right. Yeah. And then we talked about uh, the, some of the major aspects of uh, the rule systems. So we talked about constraint versus uh, uh, constraint versus rule, rule ordering versus constraint ranking or interaction, and so on. And 
two kinds of it related to representations we talked about constraints that hold at one level which we call the formation rules or formation constraints formation templates if you wish and uh, rules or laws that connect two dimensions of representation or two levels of representation. Uh, this I correspondence. Think, correspondence. Correspondence. That's right. And this is important to remember for solving many problems in phonology. It's important to understand that the in relations between rules or laws or constraints is a matter of A, defeasible logic or non monotonic logic. Let me use the word logic. This is the formalism that is needed on the one hand. And the other is the distinction between level internal or dimension internal and across dimensional statements of regularities. This may be difficult to understand in a conversation of this kind, yes, but we'll so try to do that in the, in the written version. Uh, then we talked about the uh, uh, nature of representations, how from the kinds of representations that we had in the <coughs> sound pattern of English, phonology evolved into fairly complex uh, systems of representation of uh, different levels and different dimensions of representation, different kinds of structures. And uh, where the representations became complex enough to carry the burden yeah. of uh, the linguistic system. Yeah. And, and this this was true in phonology and in and syntax. syntax. And in fact, even semantics. Semantics. Versus, yeah, all. And all of those, yes. Then we talked about uh, the uh, modularity. Modularity has two aspects at least. One is the where the rules or constraints hold. It could be the same set of constraints, system of constraints, but depending upon where they hold, they will have different consequences to the phenomena. And the other is uh, modularity also gives rise to, if you're thinking in terms of input output, the input to a module versus output of a module. But the input and output need not necessarily be seen as, you know, uh, procedures in mathematics, people use the word function. And they also talk about input to function and output of the function. But that doesn't mean that function is a procedure, function is simply a statement of a certain kind of relation. Uh, so this is this this idea is neutral to uh, okay. the procedural versus okay. non-procedural. You okay, might so, be going too far away. Okay, that's true. So let's let's kind of these are the three things that we broadly talked about. And the rest of it, I think we have to do in the uh, version. And also, um, we will now take general questions, yeah. not even, until mean, now we had said only clarificatory questions. So now, I, actually, not even questions, we will comments. just have a discussion. Yeah, let's, comments, let's... Uh, comments and criticisms, objections. Uh, Suggestions. What, yeah. 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 Okay, well, thanks for listening. Right, so that brings us to the end of all the five parts. Uh, we will uh, go back to some of those questions that came uh, sort of in between while we were transitioning from one part to the other. We will start with um, Niranjan's question. Yes, we can start with Niranjan's question. Yeah, could you comment on the recent developments in linguistic analysis in terms of amodular approaches as articulated in, say, Ronald Langacker and others? Um. I'm not. I'm not sure about uh, the a modular approaches uh, in Langacker's work. I haven't, you know, studied that. So I would rather not uh, comment on those things. Uh, we'll 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 have to study that and then respond to you in a responsible way. So not perhaps mm -hmm. now. Yeah. So I think I you, think we should leave it to them to find out and tell us. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, All right. Have to, we have yep. to acknowledge that, uh, the, in my case in particular, not in Tara's case perhaps, we moved away from linguistics proper in around 2000. So I, in fact, my last talk in Stanford, I announced that I was no longer a linguist. And people mm -hmm. objected violently. And I still keep telling people I'm not a linguist, and they refuse to accept it. And <laughs> when, when uh, uh, Reno asked us to do this stuff and my first response was oh no 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 i don't want to do it i'm not a linguist and i was kind of forced into uh <laughs> harm yeah. twisted to do this uh so what's why we we stick to the kind of broad outlines rather than the technical details later stuff so if you ask me 
what about the linguistic inquiry article in 2019? I would say I haven't seen it. Okay. Yeah. So our last talk, it was a joint talk, was in 2005. And oh. after that, yeah. Okay. Uh, after that, we haven't we haven't kept up with the latest work. So you'll have to tell us. <laughs> uh, right. Actually, um, yeah, go on. Yeah. Someday. Yeah, we have another question from uh, Shakuntala, our uh, core a colleague in Indophone. Um, Ridu, would you like to read it? Yeah, uh, so, yeah. so Shakuntala asks, I understand you say that the, they are laws rather than rules and constraints, but do you think serial OT harks back to rule ordering? And what is your prediction for phonological analysis in the future? Um, the, the, the distinction between actually rules and constraints is really extremely technical i'm not saying there is there is no uh, there is no empirical difference at all but it is so tiny most of the things we can do in terms of non as we called it non monotonic logic that's a formalism that you can use uh, for this and that looks exactly like rule ordering in many cases yeah. and, uh, and the mention of laws sorry laws was kind of a term that is neutral to rules and yeah. constraints yeah, mm -hmm. that's so how we think of it. This, think of it this way: suppose you have, uh, suppose you take a piece of iron and say, "I'm going to drop it." What do you expect? You expect it to come down because of gravity. Suppose you drop it and it goes up. You'll be surprised uh, because that's not normally supposed to happen. And then you discover on on the ceiling there is a heavy magnet, and you say, "Oh, yeah, okay, that's that's exactly what you would expect." What happens here is that there is an interaction between gravity and magnetism. That's a non-monotonic interaction. Okay, that's uh, you can express it in terms of constraint ranking or rule ordering or essentially in physics this distinction is a matter of uh, which of these two fields, gravitational field or magnetic field, which is stronger. That's how physicists use it. You know, see this, and we would like to adopt that point of view. Rather than the you know the way linguists typically think about it, so you know we are inviting to inviting people to think like physicists rather than like linguists, which is a kind of difficult thing to do. But <laughs> right, um, right. Uh, we have another one from uh, Niranjan. Uh, Somdev, do you want to read this out? Oh yes, <clears throat> Niranjan's uh, question is. As senior linguists, again, we are going back to the linguistics thing. <laughs> As senior linguists, how do you see the debates between Chomsky et al. and Pinker, Jack and Rose that took in 2000? So, yes, you <laughs> well. <laughs> OK. Uh, rather than addressing that question, let me put it this way. Uh, I don't know about Tara, and perhaps Tara would also take this position that we are far more Chomskyan than Chomsky himself. Yes. In fact, we wrote to him saying, You are not sufficiently Chomskyan. Uh, <laughs> we are at the conceptual level, in terms of the theory, in terms of the ideas, we are far more extreme uh, in that level. But we have strong, we have had strong disagreements about the particular frameworks and formalisms that you know, he has developed. And that, what that means is that we need to understand, well, our, our goal is to understand the language faculty. But the language faculty is part of the, the human mind. And so as much of the language faculty as possible should be derived from the human general cognition. Chomsky doesn't really do that because he, he began his career by you know, establishing linguistics as an independent discipline. And he continues with that battle. Uh, and I would I would go to the next uh, level by saying, as much of human cognition, we should de derive from cognition of the living systems. So there, there are many properties that are common to humans and bacteria. There is no need to postulate specific things for humans. And then the next step will be to say, look, there are certain patterns that you find in nature, whether it is physics or chemistry or uh, biology. There are certain common things that you find. And those things we should get from those most general things. Uh, so uh, I see the debate between Chomsky and on the one hand and Jack and Dr. Pinker on the other hand. In, in terms of that view, how much of it should be derived from language faculty in general? How much of it should be derived from human cognition? How much of it should be derived from 
cognition of all living things, and from the design of the universe. This Actually, is company using the term merge. Merge is not specific to linguistics. It is, uh, you know, yeah. merging, putting little pieces together, like, for example, two uh, atoms or, you know, two or three atoms to put together a molecule, put molecules together to form cells and that kind of stuff. This is, not, this is can, nothing specific to linguistics. Yeah. Go ahead. Can I just say something here then? On the one hand, we are more Chomsky than Chomsky. But on the other hand, we go even farther than Pinker and Jackendorf yeah. in uh, expanding or deriving linguistics from uh, other domains, from the broader domains. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah. Niranjan uh, gave a thank you note and, uh, of course, with a very quick question towards the end. <laughs> so, uh, well, this so is for you. Heart, we have had so many changes of heart in our lives, so it is very difficult to predict. The The first uh, change of heart was in the um, 80s, I think. When did we read, pre read Prigozhin and uh, Antonio Damasio? 84 which, uh, and 86. Yeah. yeah, and we felt that the, the grounds on which we are standing disappeared completely. And it was uh, what, you know, what you might call the dark night of the soul. Uh, and we had to... <laughs> We had to. We there were things that we had learned. What we were trained to do, uh, we could not. We had new questions, and we couldn't answer those questions with the training that we had from MIT. We had to restructure our, you know, research. Uh, and then those things have been happening uh, ever since. And it it it's unlikely we'll go back to Chomsky, but mm -hmm. uh, we will of course have change of heart. And of course, we've told Chomsky that all we've done with him is dissent with him, which is perfectly and willing to accept. For Chomsky, that's a natural thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have a couple of interesting questions from Indranil. Renu, would you like to take the first one? Yeah. Uh, are you putting it on the screen, um, Sundar, or do you uh, want? Okay. Yeah. So Indranil says, uh, uh, absence of time. Mm. What motivated abstractions that were not temporarily governed in that these segments of feature bundles were implemented by the motor system without any idea how to do so in time? Um, this is where the, the kind of project that various phonologists have pursued in terms of functional phonology, that many of the properties of phonology come from the articulatory system and the acoustic system. Uh, we didn't actually talk about those aspects, but it's, it's extremely important. So uh, a huge number of things are grammaticalizations of the biology. Uh, but to to um, go into the details, uh, so our idea was that most of the phonological uh, constraints or laws emerge out of a conflict between two things. One is articulatory ease, and the other is the need to retain contrast. If you put these two things together, these two opposing uh, uh, forces together, you will get explanations for a large number of things. Not everything, but so this is the space in which phonological systems evolve. But yeah, that's, so, that's just a kind of broad idea, not, you know, you have to work out in detail. Yeah. So but, the way we put it is um, maximizing contrast while, uh, sorry, maximizing ease while um, minimizing contrasts. No, no, no wait, wait. No, no. Yeah, no, no. Maximizing, no. Minimizing, <laughs> minimizing yeah. effort. Sorry. Minimizing effort while maximizing yeah. contrasts. Yeah. That's right. there. That's there. Yeah. Right. Uh, Indril has a, a follow up question here, um, which yeah, is. Yeah, just follow up. Yeah, go on. Right. Uh, despite uh, contrary evidence, albeit in psychology from embodied cognition models that included time as a variable. And who or what is in phonology was supposed to take care of contextual variation in time? Um, there are two parts here. One is the embodied cognition for which we'll, we are going to go far away, I think, but doesn't matter. Uh, this is the kind of ma ma the position that people like Maturana and Varela have taken or uh, Damasio, Antonio Damasio uh, has taken. So the human consciousness is not possible without the human body. No desktop computer can have human. 
desktop computers may have consciousness, but not human consciousness. Now, the kind of uh, paradigm of linguistics that we were trained in was that uh, human language faculty can be modeled on a desktop computer. It is fairly clear if you uh, look at the arguments from Thomas Yeo that it's impossible. That is where all this uh, you know, bi biology of articulation comes in to shape uh, linguistic systems. Uh, so that's, that's the position that we're taking about the so-called embodied cognition. Uh, there are various versions of embodied cognition. We are going by uh, largely by Damasio's work. And As embodied the, cognition is not just for humans, but for all creatures, all yeah, living yeah, creatures. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. The yeah. contextual yeah. variation I, and variation across time in you know in the same person speech, etc. That linguistics has been always concerned with. That that's not. I don't see exactly what the problem is. We'll have to discuss that maybe in in some written form. Yeah. So I don't know how to respond to that question. <laughs> right. Um, uh, we have a performance uh, area. So sorry. <laughs> That'll go into the performance area, right? <laughs> Contextual variation and so on. Uh, uh, so. I'm not sure if that's what Indranil had in mind. So, you know, like for example, the formal speech versus the informal speech of pace, uh, how pace affects speech. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure what it is. In fact, we don't ever say exactly the same thing. Even when we repeat something, we'll make some changes. Uh, but there are also variations across speakers. There is, so, phonology is concerned with all these variations, like any biology, in fact. Um, so that's, that's taken as a fact, you know, that we have to accept. Yeah, go ahead. Right. So uh, we have a question. Well, two questions actually from uh, Professor Pandey, Pramod Pandey. Uh, I'll just I, I'm put the it. one is here. Okay. Uh, okay. Hi, okay. I, hi, I, Pramod. When, yeah. Yeah. Is it the right one that I put on the? Yeah. Is, this is the first. Yeah, actually, the, uh, yeah. the question is a bit long and it got cut a little bit. I'll I'll put it okay. here. Here. Okay, anyway, you can, you can, you can read it yeah. here. So, uh, Professor Pandey asks, in relation to the point you made about Malayali English, do you think distinct feature interaction has a role to play, like different constraint interactions have a role to play in dialectal variation? Uh, yes, constraint interaction has a significant role to play. But more importantly, the two systems, the, the English system and the Malayalam system, come together, and they are responsible for many of the rule rule generation. The new rules that come into existence in Malayali English come from the, the, the tug of war between these two systems. That's where all the interesting things happen. I think that's, are, what, course, you mean, yeah. that's what you mean by distinctive feature interaction, I guess. Ah, OK. It's, it's, yeah, it's the, yeah, the, the contrastive. So it, let me put it this way. There is, in Malayalam, there is a distinction between alveolar and retroflex. The, the the two or post alveolar if you wish pulley and pulley are two different words in english there is no such thing so what happens here is that <clears throat> this is our hypothesis that speakers of malayalam somehow want to create that distinction in Ma in malayali english as well but then you have to create in such a way that there is no underlying distinction but there is a there is a lexical distinction this is perhaps what i'm saying is not really um, understandable because we need to show how this, the you know the, the system works. I think Pramod, you have to go to the. Uh, you can find this paper in the, uh, uh, the Rutgers. Rutgers archives. Uh, what what is the title of the paper, Tara? Do you remember? Uh, Something about Malayali English, I think, if I remember right. Hmm. Right. I think it is a slightly <laughs> longer long title. Day, yeah, yeah. Uh, we can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but uh, so I think I can't. Is there another question? Or did we get it wrong? Uh, this question was a bit long, so it got broken. Uh, okay, no. But actually, this was yeah. Do we have yeah. any more questions? I, I don't think so. I think we're. Uh, we don't have. I had a quick query. I mean, yeah. if there is no other question, I thought I'll put it towards the end. So it is. Uh, well, it is mainly my focus area, which is. Um, uh, optimality theory, that's what I'm working for last several years. So 
uh, I was uh, thinking if you can uh, bring the concept of uh, harmonic grammar and the cumulative theory relation with the existing the rule based model. So what is your call on that? It might be useful for some of our graduate students also. They always try to understand this part. Yeah, I don't think we can do that again. You know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so here is what I would suggest. We can have a discussion in in some discussion forum or written discussion mm -hmm. forum. If you ask us questions, we are happy to respond. Right, and the right. questions that we have not been able to in, in the spoken form. Uh, mm -hmm. We can continue this discussion. And it'll be nice to have that discussion in, in a written mm -hmm. version. So uh, email us the question. So if there is a. Uh, Reno, you have given some website web address, right, to ask yeah. these questions. So sure, we, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. We and make sure of course, uh, no coda platform is also there for further yeah. discussion. That's right. right. Yeah, we'll yeah. Do that. that doesn't mean that we will be able to answer all the questions. There are many questions for which we have no answers, but uh, we are happy to uh, engage with the questions. Yeah. You know, um, uh, uh, Anjali has given us the title of your paper. Thank you, Anjali. Uh, we will sort of uh, for those who are interested that you can see it in the comments now thanks Anjali. what what's the title uh, sorry <laughs> I'm, I'm curious <laughs> towards the theory of constraints in ot emergence of the not so unmarked in malayali english oh god okay i knew there was a one night long i think title. that's what okay. I would it's, a, it's, a, it's a long title like it's a site yeah, yeah. this is the one uh, that was in the okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I should have just picked on the show, right? Yeah. All right. Well, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, the rest of us will save our questions for the either the no coda yeah. forum or just, uh, you know, the good old fashioned email, uh, either one of those. Yeah. Um, but I guess, uh, before we, uh, Sundeep, do you want to put up? No, if uh, you have any questions from your side, Renu, otherwise, actually, I, you know, I'm, yeah, go on, Tara, yes, go on. Yeah, no, before you, uh, you know, wind up, I just wanted to say, uh, we didn't do the appropriate things at the beginning. Thank you so uh, much for giving yeah, us yeah, yeah. the opportunity. Can we rewind and go to the beginning so that we can thank you yeah. for, <laughs> for inviting us and so on? I mean, that's what we should have said. Actually, before we uh, wait, we, we, we have a little something for, for you. Yeah. Uh, we we can... of our... yeah. yeah. Actually, Are you giving us tea and samosas? No, no, he's <laughs> unfortunately, but uh, yeah, just hold, <laughs> hold on for a second, please. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, uh, give us a second while it comes on your screens. Yeah, in, in a moment. Yes, because this is something we thought. Um, just a second, please. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're, is it coming up? Yeah. yeah, it's coming up. And here you go with these two. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so this is. Um, yeah, this is, this is not us. We cannot take credit for this. This is by uh, Ms. Koyal Biswas, uh, who is an okay. MA student at Tezpur University. Thank you, Koyal, Thank for you. doing Thank this. Thank you, Koyal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, yeah, so she's, I mean, she's finished her master's. Uh, I, mm. Yeah. And um, she completed a BA in honors, English honors from uh, mm. Tangla College in Assam. And she hails from Tangla, which is, uh, of course, a small town uh, under the Udulguri districts in Assam. And she has a keen interest, clearly, which is evident in painting yeah. and uh, traditional and digital and sketch. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Do so, you really thank you, Cole. I yeah. just wanted to say, Coel, that uh, uh, my, at least my case, becoming a linguist was an accident. My ambition when I was a high school student and even when I was an undergraduate student was to become a painter. And oh. I spent three years in a college of art in Delhi. But, you know. Well, mine, was to, become, mine was to become a doctor and a dancer, <laughs> uh, neither Ooh. of which happened. So. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, well, you became a different kind of a doctor, Tara. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't count. We will definitely uh, send the uh, JPEG uh, copy of this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank to you. you. Yeah. Once things yeah. get uh, you know, in a better shape, we'll mail the original 
paper, the hard copy as That's well. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I, I thank you for the presentation. So, Renu, would you? Go ahead yeah, and... well, uh, I mean, uh, where does one start? Uh, you know, thank you. It's just, uh, I mean, this is, uh, this is. I, I think, I think, Indophone on behalf of Indophone, I want to say that we are all so grateful that you both, uh, uh, you know, agreed to do this. Uh, I know that uh, you know it, it isn't something that you do very often, uh, but we're very happy that you decided to do it. Um, you know, as part of Indophone's inaugural series, and you've, you know, it's not just that you both lend us your support through these last couple of, you know, since we've gotten in touch with you, you've uh, been very kind with, uh, you know, um, suggestions, feedback. So we hope that will continue uh, for the weeks, yeah, months, okay. days, and years ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, you know, we're really, really, uh, very, very thankful that um, you agreed to this and you gave us this very interesting and it's like now you know this is a resource that um you know uh, of course students grad students but also um you know early researchers faculty all of us it's like a it's a little bit of a very necessary going back you know and refreshing and sort of making sure and we unlearn some of the things we thought we knew uh and sort of learning things anew and learning to ask questions uh ask maybe a bunch of different questions and maybe we'll also uh highlight the fact that uh, you know when you said uh, it's time for uh, the next generation to ask a bunch of or well answer the questions uh, you know that we haven't been able to answer and take the conversation forward um, but thank you for helping indophone further the cause um, of you know promoting speech related research in india so thank you so much thank you to our audience uh, for uh, you know asking uh, all the engaging questions like we said earlier there is no coda uh, please join uh, of course you can write to us uh, if you prefer the traditional uh, email format uh, we will be happy to you know you can of course write directly to mohantara but or through us directly to them um, please also write to us with your feedback about the series, um, especially those who've attended the October, all the talks in October, um, or even otherwise. We, I also want to add, uh, we have our next talk uh, in about five to six days on the 3rd of November. Uh, we will be putting out more information about that. You can find basic information already on our website. We'll be putting out more uh, you know, in the next one or two days. Uh, that's going to be by Professor James Kobe. And uh, so do join. So thank you again. And uh, good night, everybody. Yeah. Thank Take you. Care. All the thank best you. To the phone. And thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. Thanks Bye. to all. We'll go offline now. Thanks to the audience once again. We'll see you again in our next talk in yes. the next week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.